The great mystery of the origin of life. How did it originate? Maybe everything happened as shown in science fiction films. Once upon a time, gray and blue giants flew to the earth and seeded the planet with the necessary molecules. Then nature and time have brought this matter to its logical conclusion. This scenario doesn't seem so unrealistic, keeping in mind these achievements of modern biotechnology, for example. Meet the Xenobot, a creepy programmable organism made of living cells. You could say it's a biological robot. Under the microscope, you can see how small clots randomly move in the liquid medium of the petri dish. They move, self-organize, and even carry loads. But if the clot is turned over, it will remain lying like a turtle overturned on its back. They resemble microscopic flatworms or even tiny tardigrades in their behavior, characterized by a complex body structure, despite their small size. But the similarity in behavior is deceptive, because the clots consist of only two types of elements, skin cells and heart cells of frogs. First, they removed the stem cells of frog embryos and differentiated them into heart cells that tend to contract, and skin cells that don't have this property. Then these active and passive components were combined, using the natural tendency of cells to stick to each other. Encountering individual cells on their way, the clots collect them into small bunches, and if you cut the Xenobot in half, it will reconnect, just like the T-1000 from the movie Terminator 2. But maybe everything went without some alien technologies and without a landing party of grey men. And life was delivered to the third planet from the sun in a different way. After all, the theory of the origin of life on Earth from space has been successfully developed by many scientists. For example, a respectable international scientific team led by Australian immunologist Edward Steele, with the participation of astrobiologist Chandra Wickramasinghe, professor emeritus at Buckingham University, director of the Center for Astrobiology, published a review article in the journal Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology, where it presented an analysis of the hypothesis of the extraterrestrial nature of the origin of life on Earth. Since the 1980s, Wickramasinghe, a British physicist, astronomer, and astrobiologist, has been noting traces of organic matter on comets a clear signs of microbial life. The scientist believes that many genetic features couldn't have arisen during random mutations and admits the possibility that frozen biomaterials were in the comets that hit the Earth. The proof of their viability was the experiment of Swedish scientists on the study of tardigrades in outer space. The samples were divided into three groups. One of them, upon arrival in orbit, found itself in vacuum conditions and was exposed to cosmic radiation. The other group was exposed to ultraviolet A and B. 280 to 400 nanometers. The third group of animals was exposed to the full spectrum of ultraviolet light, from 116 to 400 nanometers. All the tardigrades were in a state of suspended animation. After 10 days spent in outer space, almost all organisms were dried up, but on board the spacecraft, the tardigrades returned to normal. Most of the animals exposed to ultraviolet radiation with a wavelength of 280 to 400 nanometers survived and were able to reproduce. Of the third group, only 12% of the animals survived. Nevertheless, the survivors were able to give normal offspring, although their fertility was lower than that of the control group on Earth. This experiment proved that tardigrades can exist in space conditions. At the same time, the journal Geochimica et Cosmochimica Acta published the results of studying samples of dust particles taken by NASA Stardust from the surface of Comet Wild 2. In these samples, University of Arizona scientists have found minerals that can only form in the presence of liquid water. Here is another fact. Spectral analysis of Halley's Comet showed the presence of organic molecules in it. If we add to this the already proven fact that comets can contain liquid water, it turns out that the journey for microorganisms becomes quite easy. Moreover, it's clear from the example of tardigrades that some organisms don't need water to survive cosmic temperatures and radiation. These tiny animals, which appeared in the Cambrian, pose a serious challenge to traditional thinking. Their space-resistant qualities are fully consistent with evolution in extraterrestrial space conditions and are incompatible with purely terrestrial conditions, both modern and 500 million years ago. Is there life on Mars? 45 years ago two Viking landers became the first American landers from Earth, to land on Mars. They took the first high-quality images of the planet, studied the geographical features of the planet and analyzed the geological composition of the atmosphere and surface. But the most interesting thing is that they also conducted experiments in search of microbial life in the Martian soil. 
In general, these life-detecting experiments have produced unexpected and contradictory results. One of the experiments, labeled release, or LR, showed that the Martian soil gives a positive result on metabolism. But no trace of organic material was found. Where could metabolism come from? If there was no organic matter. The protocol of this experiment was developed by Gilbert Levin. During it, both Viking 1 and Viking 2 spacecraft collected samples of Martian soil, injected a drop of a dilute nutrient solution into them, and then observed the air above the soil, expecting to see signs of metabolic byproducts. Since the nutrients were labeled with radioactive carbon-14, if the microorganisms in the soil metabolized the nutrients, they had to produce radioactive byproducts like radioactive carbon dioxide or methane. Before the launch, the experimental protocol was tested on a wide variety of terrestrial soils in unfavorable places for life, from Death Valley to Antarctica. In each case, the experiments gave a positive result, they found life. Then, as a control, the scientists heated the samples to 320 degrees Fahrenheit to kill all life forms, and received a natural negative result. To confirm that the experimental procedure wouldn't give a false positive result, the scientists tested it on sterile soil, which also gave a negative result. For decades, Gilbert Levin was prevented from publishing a scientific article on the revision of the results of that long-standing experiment, which they decided to consider unsuccessful, and only relatively recently it was possible to do so. And not only because the scientific publication of Gilbert Levin and his colleague Patricia Strott was according to the authors scrubbed so thoroughly, that the points remaining are firmly established. The fact is also that in 2014, the laboratory of the Curiosity rover discovered organic molecules on Mars for the first time. In particular, the SAM laboratory found methane, chlorinated hydrocarbons, and other organic molecules. Another important discovery was made by astrobiologists from Cardiff University. They analyzed fragments of a meteorite that fell in Sri Lanka on December 29, 2012. Chemical analysis showed a relatively low density of the material, as well as a high content of carbon and organic substances. Using electron microscopy, scientists were able to detect inside the meteorite fragments rounded structures with a diameter of about 0.1 mm, resembling algae fossils. Threads that may be flagella of these algae were viewed on the surface of the structures. As arguments in favor of the extraterrestrial origin of the structures, rather than pollution already on Earth, scientists cite their location in the interior of meteorite fragments and low nitrogen content. And in 2018, Russian experts released a report with the results of a study of microbes from space dust stuck to the outside of the ISS porthole. They identified viable bacteria. And to explain how they got to a height of 250 miles above the Earth, two versions were considered. A hypothetical mechanism of an ionospheric elevator from Earth, and space as an alternative homeland of these microbes. There is another side of the process. After all, space travelers can be not only tardigrades and algae. Scientists seriously consider viruses as space carriers of life. For example, there are studies that the cause of the so-called Cambrian explosion, a sharp increase in the biodiversity of skeletal fauna about 540 million years ago, was the arrival of viral genes on Earth. In the fossils of this time, representatives of all types of animals that still exist today, including chordates, appeared in a short period. Analysis of the co-evolution of retroviruses and their amphibian and fish hosts showed that viruses appeared in the ocean 460 to 550 million years ago, at the beginning of the Paleozoic. According to astronomers, on the eve of the Cambrian explosion, at the end of the Ediacaran period, the Earth was subjected to meteorite comet bombardments associated with the passage of the solar system through a giant molecular cloud. This happens quite often by cosmic standards, since the Sun when orbiting around the center of the galaxy, passes through many giant molecular clouds, this is a well-established scientific term. Just imagine an entire galaxy, or perhaps even the entire group of galaxies including ours can form a single connected biosphere, and not just a sector of space. The result of this, on the one hand, are mass extinctions, and on the other hand, the active replenishment of the Earth's gene pool with cosmic genes that are embedded in terrestrial genomes and move evolution further. And viruses are perfect candidates for such an introduction. They make up at least 8% of the human genome, which allows us to conclude that natural selection in humans and their ancestors took place in partnership with hundreds of viruses. Their vitality makes them practically invulnerable. 
In the process of evolution, some viral genes, fixed in the genomes of cellular life forms, began to perform important functions for the body. For example, this red circle on the right, the placenta, allows both people and this mouse to spend the beginning of life in the mother's stomach. Perhaps this wonderful organ would have never appeared if our distant ancestors had not caught a very strange infection somewhere. The gene PEG-10, necessary for the development of the placenta, apparently, was borrowed by ancient mammals from a mobile genetic element, a retrotransposon. A retrotransposon is something like a simplified virus that has almost lost its infectivity, that is, the ability to be transmitted from one host to another, but still able to multiply inside the host cell and embed its copies into the host genome. They are usually hereditary, they are transmitted from parents to children, but sometimes, extremely rarely, people can still get infected with them as viruses. This is not the only case of this kind. The telomerase enzyme traces its lineage from the retrotransposon. The restoration of the ends of chromosomes that shorten after each replication depends on this substance. Here is another example. One of the genes that play a key role in learning and memory is the ARC gene. This virus-like gene is necessary for long-term storage of information in the brain. The protein behaves like a virus, and serves as a platform for neuronal interaction. ARC opens a window through which memories harden. And this window cannot open without this gene. A group of scientists led by Jason Shepard, associate professor of neuroscience at the University of Utah, who has devoted more than 15 years to protein research, believes that the retrotransposon, the ancestor of the retrovirus, entered the mammalian body millions of years ago, which subsequently led to the development of the ARC protein. A mouse with the ARC gene disabled, is not capable of learning and forming long-term memory. After finding cheese in the maze, it forgets the way to the treat the next day. But that's not all. Viruses can not only successfully integrate into the genome, but also cooperate, disguise themselves, and exchange messages among themselves. This discovery was made by scientists from the Wiseman Institute under the leadership of geneticist microbiologist Rotem Sorek, publishing the results of the research in the journal Nature. The authors of the study suggested that one of the proteins serves as a means of communication between viruses, changing their behavior. After two and a half years of experiments on the bacteria of the hay bacillus, they identified this substance. It turned out to be a viral protein released from bacteria killed by bacteriophages. By the way, if you see what bacteriophages look like and what they do, that is, viruses that infect bacterial cells, then the extraterrestrial origin of these monstrous mechanisms is not even a question. So, the communication protein of bacteriophages among themselves is a viral peptide that consists of six amino acids and is produced when a phage infects the body with bacteria and signals to other phages that the host is infected. When the number of signal peptides, and hence the captured cells, reaches a critical level, all viruses, as if on command, stop active division and lie low. If it weren't for this deceptive maneuver, the bacteria could organize a collective rebuff or completely die, depriving the viruses of the opportunity to parasitize them further. Viruses put off the guard of their victims and give them time to recover. The peptide that helped them do this was called Arbitrium, a solution. Further studies have shown that viruses are capable of making more complex decisions. They can sacrifice themselves during an attack on the immune defense of the cell to ensure the success of the second or third wave of the offensive. They are able to move from cell to cell in a coordinated manner in vesicle transport bubbles, exchange gene material, help each other disguise themselves from immunity, cooperate with other strains to exploit their evolutionary advantages. There is a high probability that even these amazing examples are just the tip of the iceberg, and scientists even invented sociovirology, a new science that studies the social life of viruses. We are not saying that viruses have consciousness, but social connections, the communication language, collective decisions, coordination of actions, mutual assistance, and planning can be considered signs of intelligent life. Here is the most burning example. Under the shell of the famous ball with suckers is a short RNA molecule, a chain with 29,903 nucleotides. For comparison, there are more than 3 billion such nucleotides in our DNA. Quite a simple design in comparison. But a virus doesn't need to be complicated. The goal is to become a key component of a complex system. Viruses can be compared to Somali pirates who captured a huge tanker on a tiny boat. They don't need the entire algorithm for controlling the captured cell. A short code is enough to make the entire operating system of the cell work for it. 
For this task, its code is perfectly optimized. Inside the cell, the virus comes to life just as much as the system resources allow. In a simple system, it can share and control metabolic processes. In a complex one, such as the human body, it can use additional options, for example, to achieve such a level of information processing that borders on intelligent life. But why do viruses need it at all? To sacrifice themselves, to help each other, to improve the communication process. What is their purpose if they are not living beings? Oddly enough, the answer is directly related to us. By and large, a virus is a gene. The primary task of any gene is to copy itself as much as possible in order to spread itself in space and time. But in this sense, the virus is not much different from our genes, which are also concerned primarily with the preservation and replication of the information recorded in them. In fact, the similarity is even greater. We are a bit of viruses ourselves. The human body has accumulated about 98,000 retroviral elements that once infected our ancestors. Now they make up 30 to 50 families, which are divided into almost 200 groups and subgroups. According to the calculations of geneticists, the last retrovirus that managed to become part of our DNA infected the human population about 150,000 years ago. Back then, our ancestors survived the pandemic. What do the relic viruses do now? Some of them don't manifest themselves in any way. Or more precisely, we don't know about these manifestations. Others work quite successfully, as we have seen. They protect the human embryo from infections, restore chromosome replication, participate in thinking and memory. But, maybe the mission of viruses is much more significant? It was once thought that bacteria were only harmful, but as knowledge accumulated, it turned out that they were not only useful, but in many cases vital. Similarly, we may soon stop demonizing viruses. They often bring us disease and death. But what if the purpose of their existence is not the destruction of life, but directed evolution. After all, we exert an evolutionary influence on each other not just as environmental factors. Our cells are directly involved in the assembly and modification of viral RNAs. And viruses are in direct contact with the genes of their carriers, introducing their genetic code into their cells. It turns out that the virus is one of the ways our genes communicate with the outside world. However, it's hard to get rid of the idea that viruses can come not only from comets, but also from this cup. After all, you can bring not only bacteria, viruses, and organic molecules. It is possible to bring almost ready-made organisms. For example, a huge number of facts point to the extraterrestrial origin of octopuses, squids, and other higher cephalopods. An enlarged brain, an intricate nervous system, complex chamber eyes, unusual fluid bodies that instantly change shape and color. All these facts are very difficult to explain by standard progressive evolution. The fact that octopuses actively edit their RNA with exceptional conservatism of DNA, says a lot. The vast majority of animals have spontaneous mutations in DNA that predetermine their further development. Meanwhile, squids and octopuses are able to purposefully change their RNA in order to better adapt to their environment. Such modifications affect the production of proteins, which makes it possible to better adjust the body to existing conditions without resorting to actual mutations in the genome. Back in 2015, scientists found out that a squid can edit up to 60% of the RNA of its nervous system, trying to adapt better to changing temperatures. And recently, an analysis of thousands of RNA samples showed that octopuses and cuttlefish, mollusks that live mainly in warm seas near the coast, also have similar abilities. But we should go back a bit, and ask the main question. Even if a single biosphere is not our little planet at the back of the Milky Way, but a whole group of galaxies with billions of billions of living planets, then where is the source? Where is the star system that started it all? And how exactly did everything work out so well? that as a result life began to spread on a cosmic scale. After all, at the moment there are several basic scientific theories about the origin of life, and about twice as many unscientific. There are both the primary soup and the clay theories. The latter suggests that the optimal environment for the accumulation and complication of complex organic molecules is determined in clay minerals. There is a theory about the origin of life at the bottom of the ocean, in the vicinity of the black smokers, where the destructive radiation of the young sun couldn't reach. There are protocells, an RNA version, and even an amazing endosymbiosis. 
At the end of the 19th century, it was noticed that chloroplasts, organelles of a plant cell responsible for photosynthesis, replicate separately from the cell itself. Soon there was a hypothesis that chloroplasts are symbionts, cells of photosynthetic bacteria, once swallowed by the host and left to live there forever. Later, the hypothesis of endosymbiosis was expanded to include mitochondria, organelles that consume oxygen and supply energy to all our cells. To date, this hypothesis is now considered a full-fledged, repeatedly proven theory. Suffice it to say that mitochondria and plastids have their own genome, and more or less cell-independent division mechanisms, and their own protein synthesis systems. Other endosymbionts have also been found in nature that don't have billions of years of joint evolution behind them and are at a less deep level of integration in the cell. For example, some amoebas don't have their own mitochondria, but there are bacteria included inside and performing their role. There are hypotheses about the endosymbiotic origin of other organelles, including flagella and cilia, and even the cell nucleus. Let us know with a like and comment if you enjoyed the video. And turn your notifications on, so that you don't miss the next video. That's it for today, thank you for rating the video and your opinions in the comments down below. See you soon.